Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. Be sure to keep watching immediately after the sermon for Postscript, a weekly podcast with in-depth content and answers to your questions submitted during the sermon. You can also find it on iTunes or at faithbridge.org slash postscript. Well, good morning. It's great to see all of you here. Let me add my welcome to that of Pastor Ken's, whether you're right here in Center Court West, Center Court East online, or if you're with us up in the woodlands, it's great to have all of you at Faith Bridge. We are wrapping up today a three-part series on the surrendered life. Two weeks ago, Pastor Ken talked to us about living the surrendered life in the context of our society and the importance of submitting to the governing authorities. And then last week, he talked to us about living the surrendered life in the context of the workplace and the importance of submitting to our boss, to our employer. Today, we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. We're gonna continue to talk about the surrendered life, but uh, not so much uh, with regard to those in authority over us, but rather living the surrendered life in our everyday relationships. The people that we encounter at home and in the workplace and in the neighborhood, just everywhere we go, how do we live the Christ-like surrendered life in that setting? Before we get there though, I think it's important that we remind ourselves exactly what we mean by the surrendered life. It's not a surrender of our morals, certainly. It's not a surrender of our values. It's not a surrender of our our basic worth as human beings. What it is, biblically speaking, first and foremost, is a surrender, a complete and total surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's coming to a place in our lives where we recognize we need Him. We need Him as our Savior. We need Him as our Lord. And so we place ourselves under His authority. King of kings, Lord of lords, He is over all authorities. And we make obeying Him, serving Him, living for Him paramount in our lives. It's a paradox, but the truth of the matter is, it is through submission that we find freedom. Like, I don't know if those two go together, but in fact, uh, that is the truth as we submit to the Lordship of Christ. Because when I submit to Jesus, when I put my hopes, my destiny, my concerns, my life into his hands, as the authority over all other authorities, I can rest knowing that he is going to take care of me. I don't have to look out for number one because number one is looking out for me. And scripture teaches that no authority exists except those that God has permitted to exist. And ultimately they will all be answerable to him. And so I can rest in his lordship. Now conversely, if I assert myself over and over, that's not going to result in freedom. That's going to result in bondage. I'm going to be in bondage to the terrible need to always get my own way. Have you ever been around a child that always had to have his or her own way? You know, I think about the only thing worse is an adult that always has to have his or her own way. I find myself in bondage to the need uh, to take care of myself, to make sure that everything is going my way, to make sure that I'm protected, that uh, my future is going to be fine, that nobody's going to get one over on me. That's what self-assertion brings about. But when we willingly, decision of the will, a choice, submit ourselves to the Lordship of Jesus, we are then set free to surrender and submit to the authorities here as well. It is a tremendously freeing way to live. Today we'll be talking about submitting to others, surrendering to others in the course of our everyday relationships, not necessarily those in authority over us, but I would contend that uh, what we're going to talk about today is actually even more difficult than the first two, submitting to governmental authorities, submitting to our boss, because you see those first two carry with them uh, an inherent incentive, sort of a built-in incentive 
to obey. I mean, after all, if you don't submit to the governing authorities, you go to jail. If you don't submit to your boss, you lose your job, lose your income. But there isn't the same sort of pressing motivation there to live in a surrendered way to those all around us, to our family, to our co-workers, to our neighbors. And so the stakes, I think, are even a little bit higher. Peter has for us some very clear words about how we are to do this. He provides for us some fundamentals of healthy relationships, fundamentals of the surrendered life in all of our relationships. We're going to be looking again at the book of 1 Peter in chapter 3, if you want to go ahead and be turning in your Bibles there. Ushers are coming down the aisle, and if you have need of a Bible, just raise your hand. They'll be glad to give you one that can be yours to keep. As Pastor Ken mentioned to you, uh, I am pinch hitting today for Mike DiStefano. Our thoughts and prayers are with the entire DiStefano family as his dad uh, recovers from just a a horrific accident. Um, I found out on Friday that I would be preaching today. Mike and I had a good long talk about that. And thankfully, he very graciously, very generously shared with me the message that he was planning to preach today. And I uh, unabashedly borrowed from that quite liberally for what I'm going to have to say today. Just sort of pulled his thoughts and my thoughts together. So uh, l- l- let's, let's think of it this way. Anything you hear today that uh, is good, <laughs> let's give Mike the credit for that. And anything that uh, you don't particularly care for, you can come talk to me about that later on, okay? So we are in 1 Peter chapter 3, beginning at verse 8. Peter writes, Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary... Repay evil with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil and their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Let's pray together. Father, we are grateful for the privilege and the freedom that we have to gather here in your house and to do so without fear. Thank you for the opportunity to lift up the name of your son, Jesus, to worship and to praise him and proclaim him as Lord. We pray now that as we turn our attention to your written word, your Holy Spirit would come, be our teacher, and guide us into all truth. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Don't know if you were into the Olympics last month. Uh, I can't say that I typically am, that the Olympics have never been anything that I get particularly geeked up over, Uh, but this year, unlike previous years, my three daughters were really into it for the first time. They, They were really interested in what was going on, the opening ceremonies, closing ceremonies, but especially... Uh, interested in gymnastics, of course, with hometown hero Simone Biles. That was pretty amazing to see. And the swimming. Now, if you haven't heard, the United States has a phenomenal swim team. Really. I mean, these are an amazing group of young people. 
Uh, they collected over the course of the Olympics 33 medals. That's just one less than what all of the other nations earned combined. So obviously a very talented bunch of young people in the swimming pool. Forbes recently did a piece called The Making of an Olympian and they focused on the swim team. And they pointed out how every single swim practice begins with 45 minutes of going over the basics, going over the fundamentals. These are the best swimmers in the world and yet they spend nearly five hours every week going over some of the things that they first learned back when they were little kids. Now, there is a, a lesson in there for us, of course, and it's this. We never move past the basics. No matter how accomplished we become, no matter how talented we become in, in any field, any endeavor, whether we're talking about sports or dance or music or art or business or medicine, whatever the case may be, all of us live under the imperative to revisit the basics. It is the basics that lay the foundation. It is the basics that prepare us day in and day out for the greater challenges that come. We never come to a place of being able to say, got that, ready for the advanced, leave it all behind. That just doesn't happen. And this is especially true in our journey with Christ. Just like in all of those other areas of life, our walk with Christ depends heavily upon our attention to the basics, to the fundamentals of following him, the fundamentals of relationship with him and with others. It is to our peril that we choose to ignore them. When we come across a passage like the one that we just read, uh, there is a danger, a danger because the the sort of terms that Peter uses there are very familiar to us. You know, love one another, sympathy, compassion. Okay, yeah, yeah, I got that. What's, what's next? If we're not careful, we can begin uh, to equate what is basic with what is unimportant. But Peter is not going there. I mean, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter very carefully lists these things, talks about a number of things in this passage that he wants us to pay careful attention to. And one of the clues we have that he is very, very keen on us getting this is the way he starts verse 8. He says, finally, all of you. Finally, all of you. It's kind of like um, when a family is getting ready to go on a road trip and dad says before everyone gets in the car, hey, everybody listen up. One last word, clue in. I'm not going to say this again. Y you know, when, you're, when your father is saying that kind of thing, he's not kidding around. He is letting you know, you better pay attention to what I'm about to say. Well, that, that's sort of what Peter is doing here. He's getting toward the end of the letter, and he's just wanting to make sure, okay, everybody listen up. This is sort of what we have been building toward, so please pay attention. Big, big mistake if we choose to ignore the fundamentals. I never saw this so clearly as I did on a flight to India several years ago. I, uh, I've learned over the years that when you are flying economy for 15 plus hours, you learn to pray fervently for a good seatmate. Uh, but better yet, you, you pray for no seatmate. On this particular flight, though, the Lord did not see fit to answer that prayer. Um, about two hours into the flight, the fellow seated right next to me is rip-roaring drunk. I mean, beyond inebriated. And... Uh, he is yelling at the flight attendants, I mean, calling them names, just being incredibly obnoxious. He's not happy with anything, becoming very belligerent, causing such a scene that finally one of the pilots came back, you know, leaned over me, pointed his finger at this guy and said, listen, if you cannot calm down and restrain yourself, when we land in Doha, you will be arrested immediately. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? 
Well, thanks be to God, he did understand, even through his drunken stupor, and he calmed down and uh, within a few minutes passed out and remained in that state for somewhere around six hours. When I sensed that he was coming to, I uh, pretended to be asleep. Uh, to no avail, though, uh, he, he wanted to talk. I, could, I couldn't believe it. I figured he'd just be hung over terribly, but no, he was in a mood to talk, and so he began to engage me in conversation, wanted to know where I was going, and I told him, well, I'm, I'm headed to India. He said, why? And I said, well, actually, um, uh, I'm a missionary. I'm, I'm going over there to tell people about Jesus. He said, really? Me too. Uh, for a moment or two, I, I, I really did not know what to say. But what was glaringly apparent was that somewhere along the way, this individual had decided the basics do not matter. You know, I, what really matters is my my responsibility, my leadership position. He told me all about his church and the fact that they sponsored an orphanage in India and that he was in charge of that ministry and that he was a leader and very taken with all of these bigger things but neglectful of the basics, things like courtesy and kindness, love. Yes, we ignore the basics at our peril. So what, what are these basics? What are the fundamentals of relationship for the surrendered Christian? Well, look with me again at verse 8. Because Peter outlines several. Finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic... Love one another, be compassionate and humble. Now, in this particular verse, Peter is using a literary device that very common with biblical writers in which he uh, surrounds a main idea and supports that main idea with uh, examples the main idea that he's getting at is to love one another. I think we have a graphic. If you were to diagram this sentence here, you can see that being like-minded and sympathetic, being compassionate and being humble actually are all pointing toward the overarching fundamental of loving one another. And without question, this is the fundamental characteristic of a Christ follower. This is the behavior that we are to demonstrate. This is the attitude that we are to have toward the world, love. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciples, the way people will know it is that you love one another. Love is to be the hallmark of the Christian life. Love is what sets us apart. And when Peter talks about this, these fundamentals, notice he does not differentiate circumstances. He doesn't say, if, if they're being nice to you, and it's easy and convenient, love one another. No, he just sort of makes the blanket statement. Whether it is easy to do or whether it is difficult, love one another. Now, why is that so important to the Christian life? Why did Jesus make a big deal out of it? Why does Peter make a big deal out of it? Because there is nothing in this world that can impact another human life like, Christ-like, surrendered, sacrificial love. It has a power all its own to impact people's lives, to change people's lives, and to make a difference in people's lives for the kingdom. Back in 2012, uh, Mike DiStefano and I had the privilege of traveling to the nation of Nepal, we had been invited to come over there to provide training for about 50 pastors and Christian leaders. 
This is something that Mike and I uh, have done on several occasions in different places around the world. It's a ministry that we really enjoy. Uh, we, we feel a sense of stewardship over the blessings that God has given to us, the knowledge and the training that we have to, to share it with others who don't have access to that, especially in third world countries. These particular pastors uh, lived in what you could only describe as dire poverty. Very desperate circumstances. And at best, some of them had a high school education. At, at best. Well, uh, as I said, Mike and I enjoy these, not only for the stewardship component, but also just because we love the fellowship with these pastors and leaders. There's something about being a part of the worldwide body of Christ that you, you feel a, a sense of instant kinship with these folks. But I noticed over the first two days that there was an emotional distance between us and the pastors. And I, I could not put my finger on why that was. It went beyond the language barrier. But no doubt, there, there, there was something there. We just were not connecting with them for some reason. But finally, on the third day, uh, the ice broke. We had taught a class on uh, the importance of servanthood leadership. That those who lead in the kingdom lead through service to others. That is our primary responsibility. And we demonstrated that uh, aspect of leadership in a very practical way. We demonstrated the love of Christ in a very practical way. We washed the feet of those pastors and leaders. Later in the day, one of them approached me. And through an interpreter, he said, um, you know, Pastor Dan, um, Initially, we, we were very wary of you two. We were a little suspicious of you guys. Like, really? Why, why was that? And he said, well, um, you know, we, we are poor and we are uneducated. We, we know that about ourselves. And here are these two men coming from the United States with uh, college degrees, graduate degrees, and uh, we, we were intimidated. We didn't know if... If you would respect us, if you would love us, if you would care for us. But today, when you washed our feet, you put to rest all of our fears. And the rest of the week was one of the best that we have ever had. Just really fell in love with those people and enjoyed a great time of learning and fellowship. Why? Not because me and Mike are such great guys, but because the fundamental characteristic of Christ-like love was made available to those pastors and those leaders. We exhibited what Christ wants his people to exhibit. The fundamental that we never get past is the necessity of loving other people. And that love may come through humility, it may come through unity, it may come through compassion or sympathy, but however it comes, love is the goal. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, sometimes we have that opportunity in a uh, inviting context, like the pastors there in Nepal. They became our friends, and it was easy to love them with the love of Christ because we were all on the same team, so to speak. But that's not always going to be the case. In our lives. For the last two weeks, Pastor Ken has reminded us that Peter wrote this letter to Christians who were enduring persecution. And I'm not just talking about a slap on the wrist. They were being tortured and some were even being killed for the cause of Christ. And yet, Peter is anxious for them to provide their persecutors with an accurate picture of who Jesus really is. In verse 15, he says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience, so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it is God's will, 
to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Peter knew what these people were going through. He understood. He had been through it himself, but he does not water down. He does not soften the message. Still, he says, don't return evil for evil. Don't return insult for insult. Gentleness, respect, love. This is what you are to give to your persecutors. Why? Because that is what Jesus gave to us. That is what Jesus gave to his persecutors. Anyone who has been paying attention to uh, cultural trends can't help but notice that uh, over the last 25, 30 years, there has been somewhat of a seismic shift taking place in our culture here in the United States. Up until about the mid to late 1980s, the secular and the sacred were able to coexist rather peacefully. Uh, Even some areas of commonality, some overlap there. Those who weren't necessarily uh, involved in church or religious activities or anything sacred, still many of them adhered to what we might call a Christian ethos. They recognized the value of the scriptures, even if they couldn't tell you exactly what those scriptures were. But over about the last 30 years, that's all changed. And the lines of demarcation between the secular and the sacred are becoming more and more visible. And the overlap is diminishing. And no longer does the secular recognize the value or really have much time for the sacred. Sometimes uh, we even find ourselves in a position where people are being antagonistic toward us because of our faith. Now, no one can say for sure whether or not this trend will continue or whether or not the church in America will ever face persecution. Uh, Thanks be to God, for over 200 years, the church has been blessed to thrive here because there has been no persecution. And may it be for another 200 years and beyond, but there are no guarantees of that. The possibility is there. But that's not any cause for concern. You see, the question is not whether we will be persecuted. In all likelihood, someday we probably will, to some degree. Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. The Apostle Paul in his letter to Timothy, second letter to Timothy, said anyone who is trying to live a godly life in Jesus Christ will face persecution. Not might, not maybe, will face it. Doesn't say what kind, doesn't say to what degree, simply says it's going to be tough to be a Christian. It's getting tougher every day here. It may get a lot tougher But you and I know absolutely nothing of the persecution that the people in Peter's day were facing or the persecution that our brothers and sisters face all around the world in Myanmar and in India and in China and in northern Africa for reasons that I can't begin to explain in God's providence somehow we have been shielded from that. And so the question is, not will it come our way, it might, but rather how are we going to respond to it? Oh, it's easy to show love and gentleness and respect and humility and all of that kind of thing when we're dealing with fellow Christians, but what about when we're dealing with someone who despises everything that we stand for, who utterly rejects the name of Jesus and anything that has to do with the word of God. How are we going to behave then? If some of the interchanges that I see on social media are any indicator, we're failing miserably. In the name of Christ, I see spite. I see anger. I see the desire to conquer, to win, 
to take back this nation, whatever that means. That is not the way of Jesus. Jesus stood before Pontius Pilate and said to his face, do you not know I could call legions of angels? Do you not know that the only reason you have authority is because my father has given it to you? And yet what did Jesus do? Did he strike back? Did he demand his rights? No. Jesus submitted. And he died. And thanks be to God that he did. Because the only reason you and I have life and the hope of eternal life is because Jesus submitted. And if we pretend, if we claim the name of Jesus for ourselves, we have no other option than to be like Jesus. We are to be a surrendered people. We are to entrust our destiny to him. We are to entrust our nation to him. We are to entrust our lives and our families to Jesus. Not one place in scripture will you find a verse where Jesus says, take things into your own hands, have an uprising, start a rebellion. That is not the way of the gospel. If that verse is in there, Come and show me later, but I haven't found it. So here's the question that I have for you. In your everyday life, your everyday relationships, at home, at work, in the neighborhood, at the ball field, are you practicing the fundamentals? Is love a fundamental characteristic of your life? I I would challenge you before this day is over to take an inventory of yourself. To ask, what does characterize my life? Is it consonant with what I'm reading here? If you're not sure, ask those who are closest to you. Ask your spouse, ask your kids your roommate, your coworkers, those who know you best, people that you trust, trust enough to give you an honest answer. Would they be able to say, yes, your, mar- your life is marked by Christ-like, sacrificial, surrendered love? Or is it not? You might learn something. I learned something about myself in the writing of this message. When I was thinking about that seatmate that I had on the way to India, no question about it, he did not practice the fundamentals, but neither did I. Because the truth of the matter was, as I look back on it, I didn't love that man. I loathed that man. I loathed him for his hypocrisy, for his drunkenness, for his outbursts, for the discomfort that he was causing me and everyone else on that airplane. There was no love in my heart. Yeah, it's easy to jump to the big things. But that's not where Jesus lives. Jesus lives in the basics. And to what degree are they a part of your life? Now, perhaps right about now, some of you are saying, okay, I hear you. I I get it. Sometimes I can be a jerk, but it's going to be different today. Uh, I'm going to work harder. I'm going to try harder. There's just one problem with that. It's not going to work. Oh, now, some of you, you know, may be able to pull it off until about lunchtime tomorrow. (laughs) But the only way that you and I can give love to other people is if we have first been the recipient of love. 
The only way that we can be Jesus for a broken world is if we know Jesus. And Jesus said very clearly, apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Jesus is not impressed with your good works or mine. Jesus is not interested in what you can do for him. Jesus is interested in whether or not you are surrendered to him so that he can do through you. That's why he came. The reason Jesus came is because despite our trying harder, despite our commitments to do better, we were all failing miserably, lost in our sin. And through his mercy and his grace, he came in flesh. And he lived that life none of us could live, but then he went a step further and he paid the price that all of us deserved, death. But death could not hold him. Three days later, He rose from the grave. And those of us who have entered into a love relationship with Jesus, who have surrendered our lives to Jesus, have access to that very same resurrection power, the power to love. You can't give away what you don't have. And the only way you're going to experience the love of Jesus is by surrendering to Jesus. Some of you here today have never made that first decision to surrender. But maybe, just maybe, today the Spirit has been prompting and nudging. And you find yourself thinking, you know, I'm ready. I know I can't do it. I'm ready to let Jesus do it for me. Most of us, though, I suspect, including myself, we made that decision a while back. But our problem is we surrendered, but then we take it right back. And then we surrender and we take it right back. And over and over, foolishly convincing ourselves, yeah, I can do it. What Jesus is looking for from us is once again to surrender to give back to him our very lives so that he can give life back to us. So I want us to close our service this way. I'm gonna take us through a, a time of prayer. You don't have to come forward. You can stay right in your seats. But I'm not going to pray for you. I'm going to prompt you to pray about things because I, I want this communication to be between you and God. I don't want it to be with me as the middleman. I'll let you pray in your own words. And as we seek God in prayer, let's give him the freedom to do whatever it is he wants to do in our hearts. Will you pray with me? Take a moment and simply thank God for the opportunity to be here and to experience his presence and his love. And if you're one of those persons who's never made that first commitment but you're feeling prompted to do so, Tell him that's what you want. That you want him. And you're ready to surrender your own life to him. And if you're like me, someone who made that decision a while back but just can't keep hands off Just tell him that you're sorry. And that you don't want to be in charge. You're ready for him to take the lead once again. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to meet us right at our point of need. And I pray that whatever conversations have gone on here between your people and yourself 
would be sealed to our hearts. And that this time and these prayers would result in your people moving forth into a broken world, showing the love of Christ. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the messages and sermons at FaithBridge by talking with the teacher of the day. Hello and welcome to Postscript. My name is Adam McIntyre and I am joined today by Pastor Dan Slagle who just finished our Surrender series. Pastor Dan, thank you so much for being here today. Sure. Now, there were a lot of questions sent in again, and some of those questions were um, about surrendering to the government. And we addressed a lot of those questions a couple weeks ago. So for those of you that sent in questions regarding uh, how Christians should surrender to the government, I want to refer you back to our Postscript from two weeks ago with Pastor Ken. Now, uh, for our first question, we have someone who is wondering um, about your challenge at the end of your sermon. You said uh, that find a verse where Jesus tells us to start a rebellion on our own. And so this person wanted to know, uh, if we are not supposed to start a rebellion, well, what about war? Um, if it weren't for the Civil War, she says we'd still have slavery. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I still stand by my initial statement sure. <laughs> that you won't find Jesus telling us to start a rebellion. Having said that, though, um, I think there is a difference between pursuing justice. Mm -hmm. Slavery, obviously, was a justice issue. Sure. And uh, living a surrendered life. Okay. Uh, you can look at any number of characters, figures from the civil rights era who lived surrendered lives to Jesus Christ, but nevertheless pursued justice. And uh, Martin Luther King, of course, primary among them, um, did so nonviolently, right. no intention of starting a war there. So uh, I, I think it is certainly possible to uh, demonstrate those relational fundamentals that we talked about, like-mindedness, sympathy, compassion, humility, love, right. and still pursue Justice. I think God has an expectation that we pursue justice. That um, the, the two are not mutually exclusive. Right. It's not an either or. No. We have to choose one or the other. Yeah. Absolutely. And and with this as well, I mean, I don't think it, it would be up to one person to decide if we're going to start a war or not. Right. Oh, right. Uh, I don't know that any one person has that capacity. Right. Uh, maybe there have been a few no. figures in history who've sure. you know brought those things about, but uh, yeah. Um, I, I don't know that that's uh, something we're going to bump up against sure. in our experience. Right. Now, um, something that is a little bit more personal, mm -hmm. someone had a question about self-defense. Yeah. Uh, they said, how do you reconcile self-defense for yourself or for your family or for a loved one um, when it comes to submitting and surrendering your life to Jesus? How do you reconcile those two things? Sure. Well, uh, I think one needs to, uh, first of all, take into consideration context. Sure. You know, context is everything. And uh, Jesus' uh, mission to save the world obviously was not about self-defense. Mm -hmm. He submitted himself to the will of the Father in order to bring about salvation right. for humanity. When you're talking about protecting your family from someone who intends to do evil or violence upon them, you, you, we're talking apples and oranges here. Right. They, they, these are not the same sort of things. And so I do not see a prohibition against protecting. I don't think the call to submit and to surrender is to be a doormat. That, that's not what that means. Right. As I pointed out at the beginning of the sermon, it is to be surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus and uh, to obey him in all circumstances. I don't know that obeying Jesus precludes me protecting my family. I, I, I don't see that. Sure. So it's, but it's, I mean, it's almost a case by case situation. It's it much is. more gray than we would like to think it is. I, I was talking to a guy uh, just a few moments ago. Uh, he was wanting to know, when have we crossed the line? When do we, when, when are we supposed to, you know, engage, so to speak. 
And I said to him, th th there's no manual on this. Right. You know, it's not like yeah. you, okay, one, two, three, now four, go. Okay. Uh, it is a case by case. And, and that's why you need the body of Christ. You know, there's, there's wisdom in Absolutely. a lot of counselors. Uh, we need to measure, we need to weigh, we need to think, we need to pray, we need to talk, uh, and, and then make a decision as best we can right. about what Jesus would do in a given situation. But uh, I'm not going to be able to give somebody a manual and right. say, here is the answer. Sure. So uh, someone was wondering, um, again, going back to your, um, your challenge to try to find scripture where Jesus tells us um, that it's okay to rebel. And so... Uh, this person brought up the situation where Jesus was driving out the money changers from the temple. And they wanted to know, was that an uprising? Was that a form of rebellion? If not, what was it? It was not a call to uprising okay. uh, by any stretch. Again, context. Who is the main player here? Well, it's Jesus, the Son of God. Sure. Uh, the divine. God has prerogatives that we do not have. Right as disciples, as right. human beings. And Jesus was enacting a uh, divine judgment upon those who were desecrating mm -hmm. the house of God, the temple. So that changes things immediately. Sure. You know, that's Jesus, this is us. Our motives are uh, always gonna be questionable. Our methods frequently questionable. Right. Uh, our understanding of the situation, uh, can uh, have questions that go along with it. And so there again, um, there is wisdom in the counsel of many. And that's why we need the body of Christ. That's why we need God's word to look at situations and be able to discern. Is, is this social justice? Is, is this self-defense? Uh, is this something that only God Right. is allowed to do? Is this a, a divine prerogative that he reserves for himself? And, and I think that instance certainly is a, is a case of that. Right. Jesus was not rallying the troops. He, he actually was sneaking around, yeah. you, you know, prior right. to doing it. He didn't right. have a horde following him there. So yeah, um, very different altogether. Sure. Divine judgment, not so much rebellion or uprising. Right. Absolutely. So uh, for our final question, uh, this person wrote in wanting to know how how can we help others submit to Jesus? Are there any um, methods or practices that we can, we can do individually to help others to submit to Jesus? Well, um, as the old saying goes, you know, you, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Right. Um, we cannot make anyone submit. Right. Uh, we can share our witness of our experience with Jesus Christ. We can live out the surrendered life before people. But at the end of the day, every individual has to decide for him or herself, is this the route that I want sure. to take? Uh, to force someone to submit would be about as contrary to the That's message right. Right. <laughs> as one could, could be. Yeah. And so uh, that, that's really not our responsibility. We, um, as I say, model it, witness it, um, give examples of it, but right. each person has to decide for him or herself. Right, well, that kind of is what distinguishes Jesus as king from every other king with, every other king would force oh, absolutely. their subjects to bow with Jesus. No, it's, he calls people to himself and he draws them in uh, with loving kindness, but he never forces anyone. Right, the difference between the gospel and ISIS. Right. It, you know, it, you don't uh, lead someone to Jesus at the threat of their life. Absolutely. Very cool. Well, thank you so much, sure. Pastor Dan, for being yeah. here. And thank you all for tuning in. We will see you all next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org slash postscript.